I'd like to open um, this fifth meeting of the 2019 Social Security Committee, Committee meeting and remind everyone to turn the mobile phones off, etc. Um, this morning we have apologies from convener Bob Doris and I'd like to welcome Jenny Goldruth who is attending as his substitute. Uh, I believe, Jenny, it's your third committee meeting this week, I think I heard you say. Yes, yes. Um, but you're very welcome here at the Social Security Committee, but I do invite you to declare any interest that you might have. Hey, thank you, Convener. I have nothing to declare. Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item two, subordinate legislation. So we're taking evidence on the early years um, assistant the Best Start grant. So I would like to welcome once again a uh, Cabinet Secretary um, to the Social Security Committee and her officials who are Dorothy Ogle, who is the Best Start grant policy team lead and Colin Brown, who is a solicitor. They're both from the Scottish Government. A uh, Cabinet Secretary, would you like to make an opening statement to the committee? Thank you, Convener. Good morning. I am delighted to be here to assist the committee in its consideration of both sets of early years assistance Best Start Grant Scotland Amendment Regulations 2019. The committee will be aware that we successfully introduced the Best Start Grant Pregnancy and Baby Payment in December last year. <clears throat> and I am delighted to say that as of the 31st of January we had issued over £2.7 million of payments, more in just two months than the DWP did pay over the last year. One expectant first-time mum who received a pregnancy and baby payment has said this payment is going to help a lot because having a newborn baby isn't cheap. We are both working and don't qualify for many benefits but are still on a low income. This substantial increase in support for expectant families and new babies shows what can be achieved if we take a different approach to social security. We have simplified the application process, promoted this new benefit and engaged with health and childcare professionals to help maximise the take-up. These two new sets of regulations will allow us to progress onto the next phase of delivery of the Best Start Grant. The first set of regulations, if approved, will make amendments to the current Best Start Grant regulations to clarify detail and to ensure that they deliver the policy intent. The most significant changes are to make provision for a determination without an application where an award of a qualifying benefit follows an appeal, and for the agency to correct an official error made in determination. The second set of regulations provide detailed eligibility rules relating to the Best Start Grant early learning and school age payments and include provision for eligibility including residence, what assistance is available, the values of the payments and when to apply. The early learning and school age payments are set out in two new schedules so that the rules for each payment can be read separately, making them easier to understand. They follow the same structure for eligibility and have common elements with the pregnancy and baby payments. The new payments are simpler in that they have a flat rate and are paid to whoever meets the criteria for being responsible for a child. The timing of the windows for application have been designed to align with the life events and other policy interventions for children in the early years. The school age payment will launch on the 3rd of June 2019 to ensure applicants can access a payment in time for children who are starting school in August this year. We have linked to the provision in the Education Scotland Act 1980 to allow the timings for parents preparing for school and to allow us to promote take-up through schools. The early learning payment isn't tied to a time of year but will also be introduced by summer 2019. We need to introduce the Best Start grant in a controlled way, ensuring that any changes being made to the system are implemented in a safe and secure manner and we will announce the start date as soon as we can. Applications can, applicants can apply from any time between their child reaching the age of two years and three years and six months. As we did in the run-up to the launch of the pregnancy and baby payment, we will undertake a coordinated communications campaign to get the message out that the new payments are there and to maximise uptake. I want to take the opportunity to highlight to the committee the significant process that has been so far and that delivery is on track for these two new payments to be introduced by summer 2019. I hope this is useful to the committee in their consideration and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yes, I think there's several questions. Cabinet Secretary, I'll start with Mark Griffin. Thanks, Kimura. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm just wondering if your department has any prediction for... Um, uptake, given although limited experience of the uptake of the um, first round of payments for Best Art Grant? 
Well, this is, as, as um, you have quite rightly pointed out, um, going to be a very complex area because these payments are new and the lessons that we have seen from Best Start Grant means that it is very difficult to forecast for the pregnancy and um, baby payments. Um, we have uh, got forecasts um, for the expenditure for Best Start Grant as was set out in the, the, the budget, so the forecast for next year in total would be £12.4 million. Um, that is the, the estimate for how much we are, we are um, expected to, to, um, to, to pay out. Obviously, this is, of course, though a demand-led um, expenditure, and anyone who is eligible to apply will be uh, given that uh, payment. So that is one of the challenges we, of course, have as we begin to take more demand-led uh, payments on uh, within Social Security that we must forecast to the best of our ability, but to recognise that that is not an exact science, as we have seen from the pregnancy and baby payments. Um, I was just wondering whether you had an idea of the, the expected demand um, Given the, the likely um, kind of bottleneck of when people would be applying for the particularly the school age payment um, with um, children starting school in August, with the application process open up at, at the start of June, um, what has your experience been in terms of um, turnaround times for applications to give people um, comfort that? Um, a, an opening of the process in June is going to give people enough time um, to get their application in and processed um, to get a payment before they need to start buying um, school clothes and equipment. Yeah. I, I think this is a very important point and again goes back to the lessons learned from the um, uh, pregnancy and baby payments where we will make clear uh, to people that the processing time may be longer than um, our um, steady state processing time immediately after a benefits launched if we see a take up um, and a spike as we did with pregnancy and payment, uh, baby payment. Um, what we did demonstrate uh, during the December January peak however was that the agency had a number of contingencies in place so while the application um, processing time um, went up it didn't go up considerably and the processes that were in place allowed um, still reasonably quick processing times. So I'm content with both what we have um, planned and the contingencies that are in place um, will allow us to be able to, to get through um, a, a spike, as I say, particularly learning the lessons as, as we have already done um, around what happened in December and January. So I do recognise that there will be a spike. That's um, you know, one of the reasons why we've thought very carefully um, about not having the early years and the school age payment uh, beginning on the same day, because that would um, you know, um, uh, further exacerbate that, that spike. So we've looked to see what we can do um, to smooth that out and also to ensure that there are a number of contingencies in place so that people can be reassured that the processing time um, will allow them to get that payment through before the, the, the school year starts. Now, that obviously depends on when they apply, um, but we're putting absolutely effort into ensuring um, that that processing time can be can be dealt with adequately and very quickly. Yep. And there's a there's obviously a nine month window to apply. What what are your department going to be saying to to parents and guardians um, as the what the advised cut off date would be um, from the start of the applications open up in June, what is the last kind of foreseeable date that you would have advise parents or guardians to make an application to make sure they get their payments in time for a uh, starting school? Uh, well, the application period closes in February of 2020, so people can, of course, apply after the, the school year um, begins. Um, I don't think um, we can say at this point when would be the last date that you would be able to apply to get your um, payment before school, um, because obviously that that will um, depend on on how many applications that we're, we're getting in. What I can give a reassurance to the committee on um, is that the contingencies, what we're putting in place, and then in the background, the contingencies that are after that, uh, we will absolutely endeavour to get through the applications as quickly as possible, um, so that people can be encouraged to apply as early as possible, um, and we'll deal with that as quickly as we can. Okay, thanks. Finally, can we have just a quick small question? You mentioned about advertising in um, schools. Uh, if I can ask as well, if it can be um, advertised in nurseries as well, because obviously 
not all the kids will be at school at that point. Yeah, I think we're trying to tie it into when people are applying and, and, and going through that process of registering for, for their school place. Uh, but as we did with the pregnancy and baby, baby payments, we will take a great deal of time of looking at every possible avenue and opportunity to make sure we're getting into the schools, uh, nurseries, um, the, the wider kind of child minders, um, private providers, all of that will be exceptionally important. Um, and of course, if members have particular areas that they would suggest that we would look at, we'd be happy to pick that up. But we're determined to, to have that as our overall communications policy, as we've demonstrated with the pregnancy and baby payment, I think was very successful. Um, although obviously we'll look to see if there's any lessons to learn and we'll do similar but different for the two payments that are coming up. Jenny Gorith. <coughs> Um, in terms of those with no recourse to public funds, the Scottish Government has said that it is seeking to persuade the Home Office that there are strong human rights reasons for not restricting access to the Best Start grant. And with that in mind, has there been any progress to allow the Best Start grant to be paid out without affecting someone's immigration status? Uh, we have had um, some progress um, on this. Um, obviously, this particularly relates uh, to those that are under 18 and therefore applying for the Best Start grant, not through a, a qualifying benefit, but through, um, through, through that age. Um, the Home Office um, have now said um, that uh, this will not be considered and therefore that we can... Um, give out payments to those with no recourse for public funds um, for these types of, of payments. Um, this is um, obviously a, a very small group. We haven't had a, an application from someone um, in this area yet. It's a very small group, but a very potentially vulnerable group um, of people that would be applying. So it's good news that we will be able to, to do that um, for this particular um, benefit. We haven't had written confirmation from the Home Office on that, but once we do, we'll be able to, to action that in due course. Okay, thank you. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, two quick questions. Um, the first one is in regard to the issue of equal claims, so two individuals putting in a claim, so the obvious one being uh, the mother of a child and then perhaps her parents, so the grandparents putting one in, and they both go in. Um, how will that be dealt with, and will it be dealt with by guidance issued by yourselves or by the, the new agency? <coughs> Uh, so, um, in, in effect, what will happen if there are uh, two claims that, that come in, um, it will be looked at what claim came in first, um, and it will be the claim that came in first that will be processed. Um, and that will allow us to have a very clear understanding and, um, and a, a very transparent way of that decision being, being made. So, it's the first payment um, request that comes in and first application that comes in. So, oh, first one, okay, okay, that's helpful, thank you. The second question is, um, can I just clarify that if, sadly, um, in pregnancy or, or later on, when, if a child dies or a baby dies, there's no repayments back, you don't have to repay that money at any point? Absolutely not. No. 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 And is that... I, I was just trying to look for last night. Is that in the legislation or is it in regulations? I was just... Looking, I couldn't find it myself last night, just for clarification. I believe that was in the first set of regulations that, okay. that we looked okay. through. And um, in particular, when we were uh, looking at the application process um, itself, there is a, a very um, specific area in the application process um, where um, a, a parent can still apply um, if there has been um, a, a still birth. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, because there is still an entitlement um, to that, and that has been um, that has been designed, and we've went through that process with the charities um, that support parents in that time, so we can make that as um, as sympathetic and as understanding as possible. So that has been a very um, specific case that we've looked at very carefully. Okay, I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Shira Robinson. Um, On the uh, application windows for the, the payments. Obviously, there are um, various application windows. So we have the, the nine and a half months for pregnancy and baby 12 months where um, there's kinship care or similar, 18 months for uh, early learning, nine months for school age. Was there 
any thought put of trying to harmonise those? Um, and what was the rationale for having the different windows? Because I guess there, you know, there, there is a risk potentially of of some confusion, particularly if someone assumes that the grants that they'll apply for as the child gets older will have the same window. So what what, what was the thoughts around around that to having different? Sure. I mean, I think in, we do endeavour to look and to challenge ourselves to see whether there should be harmonisation over aspects of um, all the, the payments that are coming in. Um, but sometimes it doesn't make sense to do that, for example, if it's over a, a kind of life circumstance. So applying for your early years payment, for example, that really does need to begin at uh, two because of uh, those that are um, entitled to their nursery place from the age of two, uh, but it needs to go on for a, a, a large degree of time, um, a, quite a large window of time, for those that haven't been eligible for a, a two-year-old place. So there needs to be a requirement for that to be larger. And the school age window is specifically designed around that time where you'll be looking to begin school and the parents will be registering uh, a child for, for that. Um, so we do look very carefully uh, to see whether there can be harmonisation so that there is a, a, a simplicity around the, the rules that we're applying. But sometimes that doesn't quite make sense and we feel that it would actually be detrimental and perhaps uh, discourage people from applying if the windows are too small. Um, Cabinet Secretary, just a few things I'd like to clarify. So we've got two statutory instruments. I think it is important that we try and get as much clarity around it as possible. Um, and all of us have dealt with the uh, welfare benefit system where things can get confusing for people who are applying. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will also be aware that I've been pursuing the issue with your predecessor about automation of certain benefits, which I know you share the same view. Um, but my first question relating to that, and I want to come on to the question of whether or not this benefit could be more automated, but I realise it might be quite complex. So to qualify for a Best Start grant payment, the applicant needs to receive certain low income UK Social Security benefits, such as universal credit. Um, could we have a bit more clarity about then what, what, what does that mean in reality? Who is eligible? Do, is, is it just those on universal credit or does it go beyond that? Um, for the best start grant, there is a, a, a list of, of benefits where people can um, apply uh, for the qualifying benefits. So there is income support, income-based job seekers allowance, income-related employment support allowance, pension credit, any tax credit, uh, housing benefit and universal credit if the award um, is more than zero pounds in the month before or uh, the month when the application is made. Um, the aspects around universal credit are particularly important because obviously there are fluctuating incomes. One of the challenges with universal credit is that you may have your your um, payment going up and down and that's why we're doing it over the two months to be able to look at that. And it's also important to stress that um, the award of more than um, zero pounds um, is in place unless you're at zero pounds because you're under a sanction in which case you know we will look at what your payment would have been before the sanction so if you're being sanctioned and that's the only reason that you're at a zero pound rating you would still acquire um, uh, be able to apply for the best start grant yeah which is very welcome so on that list of benefits then um, I mean just do you think there's any prospect of being able to automate any element of the of the grant based on that list? Well, I, I do um, really do appreciate your your continuing um, interest in this, and, and I, I, I do have um, I'm very sympathetic to looking at what we can do in in the future. Um, our, our, I suppose our, our first task is to get the system up and running with a safe and secure transition to this benefit and for that to be working successfully. Um, what we are putting in place um, at this point is, for example, um, when you apply for, say, a, a, a pregnancy and baby payment, um, you will um, in the future then be invited to apply for the early years payment and for your school age payment. Now that's not automated, I appreciate, but that's the type of, of aspects that we're looking to, to do as the system works at um, the moment. Um, we can also take information around other siblings, for example, when somebody's um, applying for uh, your 
pregnancy and baby payment um, to see whether they should be encouraged to apply for a different type of payment, for example, early years payments for um, a, a sibling. So that's what we're looking to do and are doing at uh, the moment. Um, and as the service develops, as it matures over the years, um, we, we will continue to look at further automation to see whether that is something that, that could be done and could be, could, be, um, could be taken up for Best Start Grant. Thank you very much. Alison Johnson. Yeah, um, I suppose automation is all about making the system as simple as possible, but I'd just like to understand, I mean, given that there have been far more applications than you might have expected and so many successful applications, how has that been for you know, for the new body dealing with this? Um, I, I think um, I'm grateful to, to, to you for answering, um, asking that question because it, it gives me the opportunity to put on record uh, my thanks to the staff at the agency who um, had, a, let's say, a, a busier Christmas and New Year than they perhaps anticipated and running into January, and they dealt with that in an extremely professional um, manner. Um, I, I think the staff themselves really rose to the occasion um, and they know that they made a difference to people by processing those payments. Um, and there's a great deal of pride within the agency about how they dealt with that. And that goes right from the client advisors all the way up. Um, and I'm extremely grateful for the agency and for the wider social security directorate and how flexible they handled um, this situation. Um, uh, the staff were on, um, you know, there was more overtime. There was staff being um, deployed from other parts of, of the agency, for example, those on carers allowance supplement assisted with the best start. So it, um, it really was a great test of the agency when it was still um, quite small in number. But I think they proved themselves um, exceptionally capable to be able to, to deal with that. And I think they should take a great deal of pride of what happened um, and how that was dealt with over December and January. And when we look at the uh, the feedback that we were getting from clients, um, they felt uh, they had a very professional service. They felt they, they had a very good service from that, despite the fact that it was an exceptionally busy time. Uh, there is no script and never will be within our agency to rush people off the phone. And they certainly felt that they got a, a very good service, despite the fact it was um, slightly busier than we all anticipated. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just finally, then, um, just for the purposes of um, completeness, um, I mean, I realise actually there's a lot of complexity to these regulations, and it strikes me that it may be that um, some of it may have to be revisited in the light of experience. Um, but there's two issues outstanding. I just want to see. Um, I'm sure it is contained in the regulations. It would just be helpful for the record. Um, so whether the requirement to make a new determination should cover those who gain eligibility through being awarded a backdating qualified bid as a result of mandatory consideration. So as you know, under the new Social Security Act, um, there can be a redetermination and someone can be waiting for that. And then, of course, there might um, be a, an appeal following. Uh, and also whether someone who has correctly refused a Best Start grant I don't know if you want to deal with the first one, because they are quite separate. So, uh, happy to deal with, with, with that first um, convener. This, this was something that we've looked at in response to stakeholder feedback. Um, and I think you're quite right to point out when we have new benefits, new types of payments coming up, there will be lessons that we've learned. And certainly the way the government is approaching this is we are very open to stakeholders coming back and... and um, you know, giving advice and suggestions on how the regulations could be improved, even if that's reasonably um, soon after um, the start date. And I think we should be open um, about that if it, if it assists. The reason that, that this was done was because obviously when you're looking to appeal for the qualifying benefit, that could go over for a fair degree of time and push you over the time limit that we had currently within the regulations as they stand at the moment. That's not the, the same under a mandatory reconsideration. Obviously, the time scale for that is, is much, much smaller. Um, so there isn't felt that there's a need to, to, to mention that. Um, it's not something that's came back from the stakeholders uh, that that's an issue. And that's particularly just to do with the length of time that an appeal will take. Um, when you compare that to the, the time that a, a mandatory reconsideration takes. And the second one was, um, so whether someone who was correctly refused a Best Start grant, so let's assume it was correctly <laughs> refused, um, can a second application for the same type of Best Start grant payment for the same child because they start to receive a qualifying benefit? 
Um, so if their circumstances change, if you like, and they start to receive a qualifying bene benefit, while well, still within the application window, would they be eligible for the benefit? Yes, they, they can make um, a second, uh, second application um, in, in that case. That, that would be um, welcome and uh, will ensure that, that that's within the you know, letters that go out, for example, to make that clear to, to clients as well. OK. Um, final question, Keith Brown. One point, really, that... Um, I really welcome what's been said about the kind of um, approach that's been taken, which is this is the state trying to, wanting to help and generally wanting to help because the experience of many people with benefits in the past has been it's a series of obstacles and it's a thing that you've got to discover for yourself. I remember a number of years ago as a councillor, there was a pension benefit application which was 100 questions long and it was a pension benefit and the last question was, are you pregnant, I think. So sometimes people are quite cynical about the way the state goes about this, but the, the approach that you described, especially about the communications of making people aware of this, I think is is the right approach. But I suppose my concern is about sustainability. And given the work that you've done on this, Cabinet Secretary, what is your feeling as to whether the approach that you're taking, both the ethos about trying to help and the benefits themselves, will be sustained? Is there general cross-party support? Or are you likely to see this being questioned in future? I, I don't know if it's a difficult thing to answer. But. Um, I would very much hope that there can be a, a great deal of cross-party support for, for this, um, just as we had for the, the, the Bill Now Act uh, that went through. Um, I think we can make an exceptional difference in the way that we're developing the social security and the, the, uh, the difference that will make. And I'll, I, I'll give um, uh, one example of, of that, if, if I can convene, and it's actually from Dr Allen's constituency where I visited uh, last week where I visited in the citizens' advice up there, and there was um, a, a lady who came in to seek uh, the support of citizens' advice because she was frightened, concerned about phoning up for an application for Best Start grant um, because of her previous experience with DWP. Um, and after she had heard how um, the conversation went and um, how supported uh, the um, the member of staff was at Citizens Advice. Uh, she then said she was quite happy to carry out the further conversations herself and do that independently um, and, and pick up the phone to the agency because she understood that she would be supported and that it was a very different conversation. Uh, now, I know that's one example, but it's a real testament to the difference that you can make, um, both in terms of therefore taking a pressure off Citizens Advice because they are no longer having to support that lady because the service is delivering for the client um, directly and the difference you can make to a vulnerable client um, who perhaps had a great deal of anxiety about approaching um, a government agency, and that's now gone, and that's the difference that we can make. And because that is so embedded in the agency, because the client advisors themselves take great pride in actually going the extra mile for it, then I'm absolutely determined that that can carry on um, without any problem at all. Thank you very much. I think that concludes the questions, in which case I invite Cabinet Secretary to move the first motion, and I'm going to say what that is so we're clear. It's S5M15626 that the Social Security Committee recommends that the Early Years Assistance Best Start Grant Scotland Amendment No. 1 Regulation 2019 draft be approved. Uh, would you like to move the motion, Cabinet Secretary? Formally moved, Convener. Is the committee content to recommend approval of this instrument? Yes, yes we are agreed. Uh, therefore, I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to move the next motion, which is S5M15629, that the Social Security Committee recommends that the Early Years Assistance Best Start Grant Scotland Amendment No. 2 Regulations 2019 draft be approved. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move the motion. Moved. Thank you. Is the committee content to recommend approval of this instrument? We are. That's agreed. Uh, well, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary, for your attendance this morning. And also thank you to your just, just um, officials. And I'm going to suspend briefly before we go to the next item.
We'll reconvene at agenda item four, still on subordinate legislation, and the committee will take evidence on the funeral expense assistance Scotland regulations 2019 in draft, which is subject to the affirmative procedure. Um, so I'd like to welcome Lucy Carmichael, uh, who is the Funeral Expense Assistance and Funeral Poverty Policy Team Leader, and also we've uh, also got Colin Brown once again um, with us from, from the Scottish Government. Um, Cabinet Secretary, would you like to make an opening statement on this set of regulations? Thank you, Convener. Arranging a funeral can be hard, and if a person is also struggling to pay for it, then that experience can be even more difficult. The committee will be aware from the evidence session held on the 21st of June 2018 <clears throat> as part of the consultation for these regulations that many factors can impact on the cost of a funeral. These include decisions about burial or cremation, the location of the funeral and the type of coffin, flowers and memorial service. I welcome this opportunity to highlight to the committee the significant difference these regulations will provide for people on low income benefits in helping with a contribution towards funeral costs. We are making good progress in preparing to deliver funeral expense assistance and are on track to launch this summer. Our priority for funeral expense assistance is to ensure that people can continue to access the financial support they need when arranging a funeral, while at the same time improving the support that is available based on the feedback we have received. These regulations, if approved, will put in place a benefit that is in keeping with our social security principles, investing around £2 million of additional Scottish Government funding each year on top of the resources transferred by the UK Government. This commitment will take annual spending to over £6 million in the first full year of operation. <clears throat> the regulations set out in detail the entitlement rules for funeral expense assistance. These include provision for eligibility, what financial support is available and when to apply. Key improvements we have made include designing the eligibility criteria so that it reaches as many of the groups identified by stakeholders as possible, and in doing so we have widened eligibility by 40%. This will support people who would otherwise receive no support at all from the current DWP funeral expenses payment. The substantial widening of eligibility shows what can be achieved if we take a different approach to social security. We are also simplifying our application process to make it clear who Scottish ministers would expect to be the nearest relative arranging the funeral in most cases, while at the same time retaining some flexibility with the application of nearest family member to ensure difficult family circumstances such as estrangement can be recognised on a case-by-case -case basis. Following the consultation on draft regulations, we have made further changes to our policy, <clears throat> including not requiring 16 and 17 year olds to take responsibility for a funeral where another family member or friend wishes to organise the funeral and receive a payment. We have also decided to assess universal credit eligibility over a two month period. I've ensured that people who have a zero award due to a sanction are eligible for assistance. Making all of the changes that have been suggested to us isn't affordable, however, uh, we will be annually increasing the other expenses flat rate element of the payment to take into account the impact of inflation from 2020-21 onwards, and that is something that the UK Government has not done for 16 years. The changes we have made will mean that the payment process for funeral expense assistance will be simpler and more transparent than the current funeral expenses payment. In addition, we will continue to engage with key stakeholders to promote this assistance, to maximise take-up and will undertake a coordinated communications campaign. Funeral expense assistance will foster dignity, fairness and respect by minimising intrusive questioning for clients where possible by making the most of existing sources of information to evidence applications. Our assistance has our assistance has been built on modelling, research and collaboration with stakeholders and engagement with users to provide a sound evidence base for our decision. I would like to recognise and thank the individuals and organisations that have helped us develop funeral expense assistance to this point. And I welcome the opportunity to assist the committee in its consideration of the Funeral Expense Assistance Scotland Regulations 2019. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. And we'll start with Alistair Allen. Thank you, Kandina. Um we heard uh, earlier on, um, in fact, it was Jenny Gilruth raised the question about um, passport and benefits in another context. Um, I wonder what, um, the, uh, what the Scottish Government can do about passport and benefits in this situation. Obviously, um, you've made clear that there are strong human reasons, as we've heard, uh, when it comes to the best start scheme um, uh, around this. But will, um, for instance, uh, similar... Um, uh, measures be taken to 
to um, try and engage the Home Office to allow access for groups such as asylum seekers uh, and other groups with no recourse to public funds when it comes to, to this particular benefit? Uh, well, the Scottish Government is, is obviously very keen to do um, anything that we can to assist those with no recourse for public funds. However, there is um, a challenge that, um, obviously, if we um, change the eligibility, um, that the individual themselves will be in breach of their immigration status, leading to potentially severe consequences. So it's not something that in any way can be undertaken lightly. Uh, the difference between... Uh, what has happened with the best start grant payments um, for um, groups uh, that are now eligible, although they have no recourse to public funds, are very different uh, to the funeral expense um, assistance. Um, and I think, um, well, we did consider this matter as we were looking at um, eligibility because of the very great difference that there is between BSG and funeral expense um, assistance um, that um, the, the Home Office would, would not um, apply the same recognition. Um, I, I think we have to understand as well what, what has happened with the Best Start grant payment recognition from the Home Office um, is exceptionally unusual um, and was particularly in relation to um, uh, very compelling arguments that we had around that particular case. Um, and those are not the same under funeral expense assistance and therefore the Home Office would, would not grant uh, the, the same um, eligibility for that. The only other point I want to raise more generally was about take up and, and what you're doing to, to engage people around the issue of take up. Well, it is very important with every single um, payment that we are taking on that there is a bespoke uh, communications policy that's developed in conjunction with, with stakeholders. Uh, so <clears throat> because of the um, amount of uh, and the, the level of stakeholder engagement that we've had um, already as these uh, regulations have been developed. We're beginning to get an understanding about what that would involve, uh, but we're still continuing to work with uh, funeral directors, um, um, for example, reg registrars with when, when the registration of, of a death, um, what we can do around Scottish Government publications um, around um, funeral poverty, funeral um, e expenses. So all of that's been looked at. It's not determined yet and finalised yet, but we're taken very seriously. And again, as I said, when in relation to the Best Start grant, if the committee has um, particular suggestions, requirements, or any member feels that there's something um, that we need to be looking at at that, then it is absolutely the opportunity to still be able to, to input into that process. Thank you. Jeremy Balfour. Good morning again. Just three questions of actual care in different areas. Just kind of following on from that previous question around qualifying benefits. Uh, during my consultation, there was quite a few people responded to say that things, for example, like council tax reduction, maternity allowance, should be included to make it a wider available benefit. Um, you, you've obviously decided not to go down that road. And I just wonder why and how many people do you think are going to be excluded from getting this benefit because of the, the way that you've drawn up the, the criteria? Well, we do have to, to, to make decisions around how we define low income, um, and that is, is done through the qualifying benefits um, that we have. Um, the, the, the aspects that, that you've mentioned there, in particular for council tax reduction, um, the, the suggestion is that that wouldn't particularly add that many people to, towards um, um, qualifying or, or not um, for, for uh, the funeral expense um, assistance because they will be covered by the other qualifying benefits that, that we have. Um, when it comes to maternity um, allowance, that is um, obviously not a, a means-tested application, so therefore you would be getting people um, on higher incomes that would be um, part of that process and if we're being very targeted around this which we are for it's for people for low incomes um, that it wasn't viewed as um, reasonable to be to extend that to, to something like maternity allowance that would include those that weren't on a low income so there were reasons behind um, the decisions that we've taken around all of the eligibility but I hope that explains the two specific ones that, that Mr Balfour's mentioned. Uh, yeah okay thank you I mean the second area and this is a wider issue, I think, for going forward, but is, is the, the comment that you will cover reasonable funeral costs in regard to burial, in regard to 
cremation in regard to all that. And, and as we're aware, there's a mass variation across the 32 local authorities in regard to what is charged. Some areas, I think, are starting to use it um, as a way to earn income, while others are, are, are much lower. And, and I'm, I'm just wanting to seek clarification. Will you meet each local authority's cost for a burial or cremation? Or does reasonable mean you would only coverage the average cost across a local authority in Scotland? Because clearly, with such variation, there may well be people who are having to pay, would have to pay up a lot more, if that makes sense. No, it, it, it does, and, and you're um, absolutely right to, to point to the fact that there are um, significant variations between local authorities um, when it comes to uh, the cost of a burial or a cost of the uh, cremation. Um, that's something which has been looked at, obviously, within the wider work within um, Ms Campbell's portfolio around funeral poverty and the guidance um, that um, was consulted on. Um, recently, and that will be something which the government, I'm sure, will, will come back to. Um, with uh, reference to the specific um, question, it's the average burial or cremation costs in each area. So it's not the average for the whole of Scotland, it's the average for, for that area. So hopefully that clarifies um, what's, okay. yeah. what's uh, relevant. OK, I think, I think that's helpful. Uh, um, thank you. Um, the final, um, one of the issues that's come out in the evidence we took earlier on this was in regard to the application and then the processing of the application. Because, again, when someone dies, the, the undertaker takes that liability on board. And if he or she isn't guaranteed that money, that has caused, I think, issues around that. Just in regard to the processing of an application, have you, got, have you set a kind of time scale for the agency to be able to process that so that undertakers and families can have a confidence they will either get the money or not get the money? Well, I think the initial starting point that um, is to make the eligibility and the application process much, much easier. So hopefully it will be um, both for uh, families and for um, funeral directors um, um, a lot clearer whether a, pe a person will um, be likely eligible or, or not for the benefit because part of the challenge was it was so complex before. Now that obviously still requires people to, to apply and to, to get their payment and when we're looking at that we have said uh, that, that the <clears throat> uh, a completed application with uh, all relevant um, evidence will be processed within 10 working days um, and that will hopefully assist um, both uh, the family um, and the funeral directors have some reassurance around timeframes um, for that. I think the third aspect I would uh, point out to finally is also the, the pre-application support that's it's available. So it's not just that the agency doesn't want to hear about you until you're ready to fill in your application form, but it's what the agency can do um, if um, advice and assistance is required. Now, obviously, we're not making... Um, we're not making an in-principle decision at, at, at that point, but if there's clarification that client advisors can make um, either to, um, to a family directly or to, to those that are assisting um, with um, the, the burial, then hopefully that will, that will be of, of use as well in that process. Okay. Thank you. Alison Johnson. Um, thank you. Yeah, I suppose on that point of eligibility criteria and so on, DWP figures suggest that around 32% of people who apply for the UK funeral payment don't receive it. And you know, it's probably a very difficult time to have a, a refusal. Um, and it's just, I appreciate what the um, Cabinet Secretary is saying there about pre-application support, because I suppose in some ways it would be you know, good to move to a situation where the eligibility was so clear that people didn't <laughs> apply where they were likely to be refused. I'm just wondering what, um, you know, what has been put in place to, to try and make that refusal as unlikely as possible, given the circumstances? Well, I think that's a very important point, it, to, to try and make it as, as simple as possible. The, the reasons why people are refused is, is um, 
an unfortunate, very good example of the, the poor data that we have around the system at present about why people are refused and why those don't take place. Um, and one of the areas that we're working very closely with stakeholders on is what management information should the agency collect that would assist us in learning why people are being refused? So is it still a a, a misunderstanding about eligibility or are there other factors and I think simply at the moment it's it's not we're not able to to, to say that um, with any um, um, definitive understanding because of the type of data that's currently um, collected and the way that it's collected by DWP so we're working very clear, carefully with stakeholders to learn what information should we gather to further then learn and adapt um, if there are particular reasons why there are refusals that we need to look very seriously at. Because you're absolutely right, if we can reduce that rate of refusal, then we will reduce the, the, the stress, the anxiety, the process that a family is going through at obviously um, a very difficult time already. Yeah, one of the things I think we took when we took evidence earlier, um, I think we were made aware of the fact that a, a coffin wasn't considered a um, an essential cost in the regulations and you know I think we were advised that um, you know a body wouldn't be accepted w without one and I just wondered if um, anyone has been looking as to, to why that is the case because it would seem indeed to be an essential cost. Um, I'm not aware of that particular evidence that, that came um, up um, but I'll perhaps rather than trying to to read the sheet I've just been given, maybe refer to, to Lucy to be able to pick that one up. So um, you're, you're correct. At the moment, um, a coffin is, con is included in the £700 um, element of the DWP payment. Um, that will continue to be the case under the process that we have set out. Um, so looking at this, there's quite a lot of variation in terms of how much a coffin can cost. If we included it in the reasonable necessary cost but specified a particular coffin we thought that could attach a stigma to the benefit if you're only allowed particular options so we didn't want to do that um does that help i yeah, know that, that that's helpful i'm just interested to to you know understand the thinking behind that okay, the other side of alison johnson's um issue is as i'm concerned if people don't apply who would be accepted um and just, I think actually of, of my granny who um, was born in Inverness but lived all the days in Edinburgh. When she um, went to, we went to her funeral in Inverness, she had bought everything, in fact, ordered the cakes and the tea and specified which cakes were to be um, eaten as well. But many older people are very, very concerned and not going to provide a burden to people further on. And going back to Alison Allen's point about how you get this information out there, you'll be aware there's a, almost an avalanche of adverts on TV just now encouraging older people either to use their pension entitlement or their equity in their house to make provision for funeral expenses and playing on this guilt about uh, being a burden on others. Mm -hmm. And just in, in, in relation to how you put out what people are entitled to there, um, have you thought and you asked for suggestions, have you thought about the idea, I know it's very expensive, but of maybe not just in relation to this benefit, but to other benefits of TV advertising to meet that kind of challenge head on? It, not particularly TV advertising as such, but what we do with, with every single benefit is look at um, where that relevant demographic um, will be. So, um, for example, when we were looking at uh, the pregnancy and baby payments, there was a decision to do out-of-door advertising in areas that were very, very close to GP surgeries. Um, and hospitals, because that's where you would be going to visit your midwife, for example, um, and to take up. So we look very, very um, specifically at each um, at, um, at each benefit and and where is the best place um, to, to be able to get that message out. And you do point out um, absolutely correctly um, that um, um, there is a, a great deal of other information out there about how you can... Um, um, save for a funeral um, and our challenge <clears throat> that we are um, absolutely ready to take on is, is how we get the information out there that there is this benefit because it's I think one of the ones that has the, the lowest awareness 
um, out there and, um, and and if we can break that and, and ensure that people have a better understanding of that, then, then we can take that burden, as you say, quite rightly of, of um, people who feel that, that, that um, the onus is on them to, to save in, in their later years for this when there actually is government assistance there for them. Okay. Michelle Ballantyne. Just a quick supplement to that. Um, I would have thought one of the ways to, to ensure that people do know about it and, and get the help when they need it would be for undertakers themselves to be well educated on it, to have forms there, so that when they first sit down with the family, one of the things they should be saying is, um, are you aware there is a grant if, if you're eligible, here's the details, and at least allow the family to be told at that point and then to go away. So I just wonder if you've got any plans to make contact with all undertakers, give them all the necessary information. Uh, yes, I mean, that's that's very much all well underway and they're, in effect, assisting us with the information and how that would be best um, formatted and developed to allow them to have that as part of the process um, and we need to have a, obviously an understanding about the types of conversations that are had and when is the best time for for that information to, to be made available um, but there's a, a, a great deal of um, cooperation uh, that's already happened between the government and stakeholders particularly funeral directors and um, and and those in, involved uh, to make sure because um, they also want to provide a uh, reassurance um, for um, those that are coming to, to them um, for the cost of a funeral and they will um, in some ways uh, be maybe the first to, to spot an anxiety around costs and a concern around costs so we will absolutely be working um, very very uh, closely to ensure that we do all we can. I think um, the, the, the challenge that, that Mr Brown um, quite rightly points out is, is actually before that stage and actually providing reassurance for, for, um, for um, an elderly person um, directly that they don't have to save for, for a funeral. So that's why we have to look at it from all different angles and from every availability. But I've been really heartened by the, the close working relationship that we've had as these have progressed with funeral directors, for example. Are you providing actual training? Are, are they getting training sessions, or is it just writing out to them? Not not training, but we have. I mean, I, I was at a, the a stakeholder reference group on this. I think just last month. Um, where they were having discussions on this very issue. So with their industry bodies, um, we were have that um, wider discussion. Um, and then, just as we did for, as I say, the best start payments, um, we will be having roadshows across the country to be able to then get that message um, out in different locales within, within Scotland as well. So we're working very carefully within the stakeholder reference group uh, to develop that work. And then once it's developed, we'll obviously then take that out uh, to, to wider, um, well, a wider uh, group um, at, at the relevant point. And we need to be careful, obviously, of the timing of that because uh, we don't want to confuse people, uh, not the funeral directors, but, but the, uh, confuse people when the benefit will be starting and when the DWP one is still in place. So we, we just need to be um, uh, mindful of that. But that work will, abs will be undertaken before the benefit goes live. OK, thank you. Just two final questions from me. Um, first is, so the 10-day application processing time is obviously quite important. And I wondered if the Cabinet Secretary thought it should be in legislation, a bit like the redetermination processing time, rather than in guidance. Is, is, is there a case to kind of be belt and braces on that one? <clears throat> Well, this is an area where we have tried to be consistent with uh, the other benefits. So there's um, not a, a time for processing, for example, within the Best Start Grant um, regulations. And I suppose the challenge when you're looking at it is um, if you include a statutory processing time within the regulations, um, what's the remedy? What would happen if that time scale wasn't met? It's different for a redetermination because you move directly to an appeal. So it's um, it's what would be the benefit of, of having it there um, within regulation. Um, what we have very clearly set out, though, is our determination to do that and to make that public. And obviously that will be reported on. Um, and I'm sure the committee and um, um, others with a, an interest in this will keep a close watch and eye on whether we can uh, you know whether we're delivering on that and um, any reasons why we're finding that challenging but certainly our determination is to fulfill that at this point yeah i mean arguably it's more important in this process because it's a funeral and family need to start to make arrangements and i'm sure you're only too familiar with the average cost of a funeral these days um 
uh, it just occurred to me that so the, the applicant makes the application that it's processed and they may be eligible for this payment of flat rate of £700. So that would go directly to the applicant in order to to contribute towards the cost of a funeral. Um, is there an option for that payment to go directly to funeral directors because you really have to start the process days within uh, you know, if you have someone in the family who's deceased, so and then they start to give you the costs at that point, and I suppose it might be a bit of reassurance if someone could, whenever that process happens, at least make sure that that money is deducted, and then they have to find find the rest. Is there a case for saying, or can that already happen? Uh, so a, a, a payment can be made. A directly to a funeral director if that's what the applicant wants and in many cases obviously they do want that because it's one less a uh, one less task for them to to be involved in at that time so that that can take place thank you very much um, there are no uh, further questions um so i would like i would like to invite the cabinet secretary to move the following motion which is s5m15627 that the Social Security Committee recommends that the Funeral Expense Assistance Scotland Regulations 2019 draft uh, be approved. Is the committee, uh, if the Cabinet Secretary would move that? Moved, Convener. Uh, is the committee content to recommend approval of this instrument? Okay. We are. Thank you. That is agreed. Uh, finally, just to thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for spending the morning with us and obviously your officials for their contribution. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to suspend it briefly to allow um, our guest to, to leave the room. Convene at agenda item six, which is the public petition. I refer members to paper three and the petition by Dr. Sarah Glynn. The petition calls on the Scottish Government to make more money available to mitigate the impact of the UK Government welfare cuts through reassessing spending priorities and bringing it more progressive taxation. The committee agreed at its meeting on the 1st of November 2018 to consider this petition again following the publication of the Scottish Government budget, part of the committee's pre budget scrutiny. The committee wrote to the Scottish Government asking for the Scottish Welfare Fund to be increased to address growing pressures and need. Uh, for now, the Scottish Government has committed to maintain but not increase the funding for the Scottish Welfare Fund. So I now invite the committee to consider the petition again and decide whether or not they wish to close the petition on the basis that the policy and expenditure considerations such as those raised in the petition are embedded in the work of the committee and were considered during the draft budget, or alternatively, agree the reasons for keeping the petition open. Thoughts? Mark Griffin. Thanks, Camina. I think through the work that we've done, we, we have effectively a, a agreed with the petitioner. Um, we've asked the, the Scottish Government to make more money available to mitigate the impact of welfare um, cuts and we'll, We'll specify the mechanism for doing that through the, the welfare fund. Um, I would be content to, to close the petition on the proviso that we write to the petitioner to set out what we've done, and that we flag the petition with the Scottish Government and um, restate the committee's view that um, the welfare fund should be um, increased to address that, address that growing need. Alistair Allen. Um, similarly, I think that the committee could close the petition on, on very much the, those grounds and that we have already commented about the welfare fund. I would al also just want to offer one comment, which maybe not all the, the committee would agree with, which is that uh, while I think what we're saying about the welfare fund there is, um, is reasonable and what the petition is saying about that is, is reasonable, as a more general point, obviously I don't think this committee would endorse the idea that 
all cuts made to the social security system or in other reserved areas could be met by this parliament from devolved resources. I understand, or I saw a figure recently that suggested that the amount of money that's coming out of the benefit system in Scotland uh, in the course of this parliament is equivalent to what we spend in its entirety on Police Scotland. So um, I think that the, the points in the, in the the petition are ones I can understand. I think the point that's just been made about closing it and the reasons for closing it are reasonable. But I just would want to offer an observation that as a, as a general principle, we can't, as a parliament, offer um, to make up for everything that Westminster takes away from us. Anyone else disagree? Alison? Okay. Um, it, not, it's not so much disagreement. I suppose we're closing this petition when I suppose we've been unsuccessful. Um, the Parliament hasn't been able to convince the government. Um, but I take on board colleagues' comments. We have urged the Scottish Government, as the petitioner has requested, to make more money available. Um, and they've said no, or certainly not at the moment. Um, I agree with the petitioner that we do need a more progressive system of taxation, and my party has worked hard to, to try and alleviate cuts to local budgets. I suppose one concern that I have is universal credit is still rolling out, um, and so this is a changing picture. It could worsen. So, um, you know, I think we should certainly write to the petitioner and to the Cabinet Secretary, but ask the Cabinet Secretary to bear in mind that this is a changing picture. That, that things could get worse and that, you know, we really do need to keep an eye on this as a parliament to make sure that this fund is getting close to meeting. You, you know, obviously we want it to meet properly the need that is there. Okay. Keith Brown. Yeah, I hadn't seen this when it came to committee. I haven't only recently joined the committee, but just to give a couple of thoughts. First of all, I just think there is um, a real kind of moral hazard to you that uh, if this parliament continues and the government continues to mitigate uh, the bulk of the cuts that come from Westminster, there's no end to that. Plus, there's incentive on Westminster to cut further benefits because we'll be confident that devolved administrations in some cases will pick up the slack. And that's just not sustainable. I think the other point I'd make is we did discuss the Scottish Welfare Fund when it was apparent there was an underspend on that. So I'm not sure about the benefits of putting more money into a budget which is currently underspend, unless, of course, you change the entitlement, which then pushes up the... Um, the, the take-up in relation to it. I think what I'm more concerned about is whether the mitigation that's here just now is at £70 million for discretionary housing payments, about £600 on average, or more than £600 a year to those that um, have the bedroom tax mitigated. I'm much more concerned that these things stay in place. And I think in addition to writing to the Scottish Government, we should ask the party leaders, are they committed to these mitigations staying in place in the long term, because that's much more of a having that kind of comfort that these mitigations will be there uh, is a, a more pressing concern, especially I think in the next two or three years to people. Anyone else? Michelle Valentine. No, I'm I'm comfortable that we close it. I was actually on petitions when the this petition was actually bought, so I actually heard the petition, um, and there was a fairly unanimous agreement in the petitions committee to pass it on. Um, it wasn't particularly evidence-based it, it, it was quite emotive um and whilst i understand you know their reasoning and where they came from um i i really don't think there's any mileage in it at, at present and i um pick up um, what keith brown was saying is is we have got clear evidence in terms of the the current um underspend on the fund so there would be no reason to, to raise it at this point but i'm content if you want to write and just say that you want to keep it sort of in mind as we go along. So I think we're agreed that we'll close the petition, um, but we obviously need to write to the petitioner, and we could send a copy of the, the official report, but we could just, I think, reiterate the views around the table. I think uh, we'd agree with everything. We, we actually specifically say in our report that the Scottish Parliament, whichever complexion, should not mitigate every single change. We were quite, so we can refer that to our in work poverty report. Um, but like Alison, I think it's a changing picture, and I think, you know, I don't think we should close the door on that. And I also agree with Keith that well, there's significant um, arrangements put in place for the bedroom tax for mitigation, and uh, those are important that those stay in place. Um, so we need to write to the petitioner, do, do, maybe just send down the draft to everyone, just to see if all the points are covered. And if we write to the Scottish Government, um, as Mark suggests, saying the same, but 
would you agree to add in um, Alison's point, which is a changing picture? Is there anyone? Just to keep the Mine, but I would also push the point that we have to have some idea about how sustainable politically this is, and the other parties should be saying if they intend to keep with this, we should know what the basis of, of that commitment is, I think. So I agree with all that's been said, but uh, I would oh. add that. Oh. Uh, surely that is for manifestos come 2021. I mean, I, I think that does verge on, you know, you're almost saying to people to commit to things before you've got your manifesto. I mean, every political party will put forward a, a programme of government for 2021 20, and beyond. I would have thought that would be the appropriate place where people would outline their policies rather than necessarily issue by issue on, on a committee. Could, if for the time being, can I stick to the content of the letter of what the committee wants to say first to the petitioner and to the Scottish Government? Can I say, that's exactly mm -hmm. the point I'm making. I think people need to know, if we as a committee are looking at the sustainability of the mitigations which are in place, I think that is vitally important information. So I think that is important to this committee to know what the commitments are to this and what the likely threats are to the mitigation that's already there. So that's why I would push the point. We should find out from the other parties who's committed to this mitigation. And if they're not, they can, they can say so. Well, I think the committee are agreed that we'd like to stick to the mitigation, is that, yes? I'm not sure that is the case, given what's been said. Well, I mean, I am very happy with where the situation is at the moment. What I think is difficult for us to do, for any political party to do at this stage, is to say, what are we going to do beyond 2021? I mean, I think all the parties have a position Can now. Can I just cut to the chase here? I mean, I don't think... I, I don't think the Commission should be right to party leaders. Yeah. I think what you're suggesting is that the committee, this is the committee's view, yeah. that um, trying to see what elements we can agree in the letter, that we would agree that the, the mitigation that is contained within the budget now is something the committee yeah. would support yeah. to continue. Yeah. Would that be fair? I don't think it answers the question. I don't think it gives... Think about the people that put the petition in the first place. Their concern is about the level of mitigation that's here just now. I think it's also of concern to them that level of mitigation... If it doesn't go higher, which is what they seek, it doesn't go lower. I think it's a really important point that people should be able to say. I, I, I'm not sure whether it is the case, for example, from what Jeremy said, there's a commitment to have the bedroom tax alleviated going forward. Um, so I, I, I'm happy to take the case, because I'm fairly new to this committee's unit. I think it will be a matter of quite uh, importance, both to the petitioners and to this committee, to flush out who's committed to these things, who's committed to the mitigation that's here just now. But I'm happy to take other views. Is there a compromise somewhere in the letter that could make a reference to the, the sustainability in, of, of that going forward will depend on the commitments made yeah. by mm -hmm. various parties, mm -hmm. you know, uh, not just the Scottish Government, and a wording that could, you know, not necessarily not write into party leaders, but basically something that says, um, you know, the commitment to continue mitigating will depend on the commitments. Of, of all parties to make that happen. And, of course, the shape of benefits. I mean, you know, who's to say, you know, what will happen to the benefit system in the future? So, you know, committing to mitigating something forever and a day is not, not necessarily relevant if, if the whole thing changed anyway. So... Uh, if the bedroom tax stays in place, will you remain committed to mitigating it in Scotland? It's quite an easy thing. If it doesn't stay in place, then obviously you can't be expected... There's no such thing as a bedroom tax. So I wouldn't even go down that route. Well, I think we're, we're not going to agree on anything if we can't agree there's a bedroom. So, yes, as a compromise. But I think everybody appreciates. I mean, to, 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 to all intents and purposes, they're changing picture in any direction. We just don't know what that's going to be. And I think Alison's suggestion is that uh, yeah, there's a changing picture, whatever that means, and we'd like the Scottish government just to keep an eye on that. But I think we're pretty all agreed because we said in a report that we don't think the Scottish Government should mitigate every single benefit change where there's a budget implication, but we all reserve our positions on what elements might be mitigated. Um, we may have a slight difference of opinion on that, but I think um, in the course of events... So, uh, OK, so we've got we've got um, the draft of a letter, so some key points there. Um, <laughs> I'll, um, we'll circulate the draft letter then. We'll try and stick to the consensus that I think exists, and we can take it further another time. But the committee are content to close the petition and thank the petitioner for raising the issue with the committee. Uh, so with that, I uh, will close formally the public session. Keith Brown. So I, 
Uh, it was just a discussion we had before earlier about... Yes, we, we can discuss that session. after we close the meeting formally. So I close the meeting formally.